The 2023 Watchtower Annual Meeting introduced some of the biggest changes to the Jehovah's Witness religion that we've ever seen. This is a compilation of six videos covering the annual meeting, in case you missed them in the past. I'll provide time-lapse links below in case you want to skip to a particular segment. Thank you so much. Welcome, you 9,000 lovers of common sense and the 60% of you who haven't subscribed yet to my rebuttal of the 2023 Watchtower Annual Meeting. Well, I previously did a very brief overview of the entire thing, everything announced at the meeting, but now it's time to go deeper, balls deep, into this propaganda. Because I believe the things revealed at this annual meeting will potentially change the entire religion forever. We're going to be dissecting each one of these atrocious talks to a subatomic level and we're going to try to find out what the governing body's endgame is in all of this. So don't forget to smash that subscribe button so you don't miss out on all the future episodes. It's going to be a pretty long series but I think this annual meeting is really important so I'm going to be showing you why exactly. Today we're going to be covering a talk by Jeffrey Winder titled How Does the Light get brighter. It's gonna get culty. Let's start. The annual meeting is introduced by Cardboard Ken, who hypes up every annual meeting as the greatest event of the year. As an example, of, I'm gonna pick a year of 2013. Now, that annual meeting has been called Landmark. We've even stated that. We called it a Landmark Annual Meeting. Well, you might think that all annual meetings are Landmark and Many of us here would agree with that, but that one was very special. Basically, it's just a massive circle jerk. We have arrived at another truly landmark annual meeting. This time, Jehovah has helped the faithful and discreet slave to discern deeper principles and understanding from that very same word of truth. And this understanding is now going to be passed on to you. Are you ready? Are you, <laughs> Are you excited to hear it? <laughs> He's just so proud of the doctrinal diarrhea him and his buddies are about to dump on this audience of deceived people. I'm about to bust, Kenneth. Release your spiritual light upon us. So are you ready to be indoctrinated, boys and girls? In recent years, the annual meeting has been an occasion where clarified understanding of Bible truths, a new light has been announced and explained. To my understanding, this is actually the first time that the governing body uses the term new light to refer to doctrinal changes, because new light is usually used by the XJW community kind of like to poke fun at the whole concept, like, oh yeah, old light, new light. Recycled light, flip-flopping light, you get the point. But it seems Winder has now embraced the term himself, which is quite interesting. I mean, was it just a coincidence? Or are you secretly a fan of this channel, Jeff? Of course, it's not at every annual meeting that this takes place, but when Jehovah makes something known, often it's at the annual meeting where it is announced. Now, will there be new light today? It's so lame how every time Jehovah drops some new light in the Bible, he does so by using thunder and volcanoes and literally speaking from the sky. But now in the 21st century, he must speak through nine old hacks attending a shareholder meeting. Damn, Big J, please send me your cash up so you can buy yourself a microphone or something. I think Brother Cook already spilled the beans a bit. <laughs> but we look forward to see uh, what will be... Uh, uh, what, what, what is in store for our program. But have you ever wondered, though, how exactly does Jehovah reveal clarified understanding of the Scripture's new light in modern times? Uh, when the governing body is meeting together as the faithful and discreet slave, how does it work? How exactly does the light get brighter? How does Jehovah use that arrangement to clarify our understanding? And this is the perfect chance to remind you that in the minds of a lot of JWs, the governing body actually has a stronger connection to Jehovah than anyone else. I mean, I kid you not guys, one time when I was in service with one of my elders, he made the comment 
that he imagined the governing body actually having a direct line of communication with Jehovah. Of course, he immediately retracted his statement because it sounded kind of culty and idolizing of these men, but it still showed me that in the minds and the headcanon of a lot of witnesses, the governing body has this certain special connection with God and uh, there's certain mysticism behind what they do. Oh boy, I hope Jeff doesn't ruin the magic by describing exactly how they arrive at new light. Well, first of all, what do we know from the scriptures? Let's look at four points. The first one is this. By what means does Jehovah reveal new light? Well, for that, we can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. For it is to us God has revealed them through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches into all things, even the deep things of God. So clearly, by what means does Jehovah reveal new light? It's by his Spirit. We recognize the, the key role that Jehovah's Spirit has in revealing the truth. Corinthians 2 is talking about the gospel, what Jesus did on the cross. It says that the Holy Spirit reveals the gospel to all believers. It's not talking about God using like the Spirit to airdrop new light to the governing body specifically. But of course, Jeff doesn't expect his listeners to actually read the Bible verse in context. So he just feels free to cherry pick whatever the hell he wants. You sneaky little weasel. Point two. To whom? does Jehovah reveal clarified understanding? He reveals it to all Christians. Well, for that, we can turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 24, and read together Matthew 24, verse 45. Who really is the faithful and discreet slave whom his master appointed over his domestics to give them their food at the proper time? So clearly Christ has, appoint, has appointed the faithful and discreet slave, and it is through this channel that Jehovah, through Christ, works to uh, provide spiritual food. So just with those two first points, it's very clear to us how uh, spiritual truth, new understanding, is communicated from heaven to earth by means of the Holy Spirit through the channel of the faithful and discreet slave. Guys, by now we know that the faithful and discreet slave is just a parable. Just like we don't expect the prodigal son or the ten virgins to be actual physical people, it's really silly to imagine that this so-called slave is going to be an actual person, let alone a group of people. Question number three. When does Jehovah reveal new light? Well, we just have to look back to verse 45. Uh, Matthew 24, the slave will provide the food at the proper time. There's a clear timing element indicated there, isn't there? And so Jehovah uh, reveals clarified understanding at his time, when it is needed, and when it will help us to carry out his will. That answers absolutely nothing. Number four, at what rate does he reveal new light? Is it all at once like a dump truck? Or is it metered out like a trickle? Well, the answer to that is found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, Proverbs 4, 18. But the path of the righteous is like the bright morning light that grows brighter and brighter until full daylight. So the Bible here uses the illustration of daylight. And what does that teach us? Well, the Watchtower said these words aptly apply to the way in which Jehovah reveals his purpose to his people gradually. I find it amazing that we're only four minutes into the talk and Winter has already misapplied three Bible verses. Three. I mean, that has to be a new record, right? I don't want to sound like a broken record, guys, but the proverb that he quoted is not talking about new light. It's talking about how the path of the righteous man becomes brighter and brighter. You know, it's that's it. That's just a wise little snippet. It's a proverb. It's not a prophecy. Well, we have the privilege to live during the last days where true knowledge was foretold to become abundant. But even still, it is released and made known at a pace that we can absorb, that we can handle, and that we can use. And we thank Jehovah for that. 
Well, knowing this, then we are not embarrassed about adjustments that are made, uh, nor do is an apology needed for not getting it exactly right previously. Jeff, you should be embarrassed because all the faithful slave has been doing since 1919 is lie. That's all you're good at, lying. 100% of your doomsday predictions have been wrong. I mean, dude, you shouldn't be just embarrassed. You should be ashamed of yourselves. You expect your followers to listen to you as if they were listening to God. Yet when it's time to flip flop on your doctrines, you just kind of toss your hands into the air and say, oops, we never claimed to be infallible. The governing body is neither inspired nor infallible. You donut. Your policies have ruined thousands of lives and you dare to tell everyone that an apology is not needed when you get something wrong? Sit on this, Jeff. We understand this is how Jehovah operates. He reveals matters gradually when it is needed. And also, the governing body is neither inspired nor infallible. And so it can err in doctrinal matters or in organizational direction. The brothers do the best they can with what they have and what they understand at the time, but are happy if Jehovah sees fit to clarify matters. And then that can be shared with the brotherhood. And when that happens, we understand it's because it's Jehovah's time for that to happen, and we uh, eagerly accept that. So if the governing body is not infallible and can make mistakes, then why should we trust in its directions? As Winder and Splain will make very clear in their talks, the governing body has made a lot of doctrinal changes in the past. So how can you expect your followers to trust you if your track record is so abysmal? After all, today's new light could be tomorrow's old light. <laughs> and at this point, this, this kind of talk is just a, a form of damage control because more and more JWs are starting to see through the absurdity of new light doctrine and Jeff must reassert the governing body's dominance over them. But now back to our original question. Okay, we understand these things from the scriptures, but really, how does it work? When the brothers are meeting together, how does Jehovah help them come to a better understanding of things? Well, that's an appropriate question because Jehovah does not intend for it to be uh, a mystery or overly secretive. In fact, in his inspired scriptures, he reveals uh, examples of when uh, understanding was clarified in the Christian era. And a notable example is around 49 CE when clarification was needed regarding the requirements for salvation. And specifically, the question was, would Gentile males first need to be circumcised and submit to the Mosaic law in order to be saved? This was a significant matter that could have divided the congregation, and so it was referred to the apostles and the older men, the governing body at that time. There was no such thing as a governing body as we know it today, back in the first century. This is absolute nonsense. And in fact, at Galatians 2.2, Paul states that as a result of a revelation, he brought the matter to the brothers in Jerusalem. So Christ himself directed that this important doctrinal matter be settled by the brothers taking the lead. And in Acts 15, Jehovah allows us to look in on that meeting, to be a fly on the wall, as it were, to, to hear their discussion, to see how the Holy Spirit worked with them, how they used God's word, how they came to a conclusion, and then the result that was sent and conveyed to the congregations. And the process is not entirely different today. Yes, yes, it is entirely different, Jeff. You just said that Paul received a divine revelation from Jesus himself. And at the same time, you're claiming that you are not inspired. So Paul was inspired and you are not. So why are you comparing yourself to the apostles if you're not inspired? So let's take a look at what happened. If we turn together to Acts chapter 15, Acts 15, and beginning in verse 6, it says the apostles and the elders gathered together to look into this matter. So this is an important matter. It's brought before the uh, governing body of that day. And then in verse 7, it mentions that there is much intense discussion. So a lively conversation. The brothers felt free to express themselves respectfully but they were sharing their thoughts and opinions about the different sides of the issue. 
And in verse 7, Peter stands. And maybe this is the point uh, that is reflected in our artwork here. And Peter begins to speak and relates his comments based on his real-life experience with Cornelius. So they're considering some facts. And if you look at verse 12, Peter's words strike a chord because the entire group becomes silent. And in this we see humility, don't we? Because none of the brothers were trying to force their personal opinion or get their idea approved. They were collectively looking to Jehovah for direction on the matter. Well, this makes way then for Paul and Barnabas to begin to explain their experiences, so more facts, more evidence that they could consider. And then in verse 13, James speaks up, and he uses the scriptures to help the brothers uh, draw a proper uh, scriptural conclusion. He applies Amos 9, 11, and 12, saying that Jehovah would turn his attention to the nations to take out of them a people for his name. So what part of this story exactly reveals divine inspiration? It's just a group of men coming together to debate on the scriptures, and eventually Paul's arguments win. I mean, sure, if you're a Christian watching this, you, you're free to believe that the Holy Spirit was guiding the whole thing, but uh, the text doesn't actually say that. Well, verses um, 19 through 21, he recommends a decision. Verse 25 indicates that that decision was unanimous. And then in verse 22, it mentions that they send the brothers out to inform the congregation of this clarified understanding. So the whole process described there, we see the use of God's word, we see the leadership of the Christ, the operation of the Holy Spirit, working through the brothers, taking the lead at that time. And so we can see it's the process is not intended to be a mystery or to be overly secretive. And the process today is not much dissimilar than that. In 2010, the Watchtower explained it this way, It said, when the time comes to clarify a spiritual matter in our day, Holy Spirit helps the faithful and discreet slave to discern deep truths that were not previously understood. So Holy Spirit helps you discern Bible truths, but you are not inspired. Well, then that's not Holy Spirit, right? Because the point of Holy Spirit is that it can't make any mistakes. Someone that is inspired is not going to tell a lie, like, you know, the prophets. So that's not Holy Spirit, that's a half-assed spirit. The point is, is that Jeff wants to have his cake and eat it too. He claims that the governing body is hand-picked and guided by the Holy Spirit, but in order to avoid accountability for their mistakes, he says they are not inspired by the Spirit? So what? So you're di- directed and led by the Spirit, but you're not inspired by it? You're just talking out of both sides of your mouth. The governing body as a whole considers adjusted explanations. What they learn, they publish for the benefit of all, end quote. So generally, the process happens this way. First of all, a question comes up. And so it could be that a governing body member in his personal study or his personal Bible reading notices something that then raises a question. Or it could be that a question comes up during the preparation or translation of spiritual food that requires more consideration. World events might put the spotlight on a particular prophecy that then gets closer attention. So in one way or another, a question comes up. And that question is then put on the governing body's agenda for discussion. And the question is, does this require or or, um, warrant additional research. The brothers are not making a final decision on what the new understanding will be, just asking, does it uh, warrant additional research? And if the answer is yes, then a research team is assigned to provide recommendations and research for the governing body to consider. And this research includes a summary of everything that we have said, the organization has said on the subject since 1879. All the watchtowers, what have we said? Also, it includes what the context of the verse indicates about its meaning. meaning. Further, what, per, uh, what bearing do parallel accounts have on the understanding of the account, if there are any parallel accounts? And finally, what impact does the original Hebrew or Greek 
have on our understanding of the verse. Wow, so the governing body does care about context, apparently. Well, maybe they should try to read the past three verses they quoted in context so they can realize that they've been misusing them for decades now. Well, once that whole research package is, is compiled, it's placed back on the governing body's agenda for review. And of course, once it goes on the agenda, then each individual member of the governing body under prayer reviews the information and thinks about it in preparation for the meeting. And then it's discussed as a group at the governing body meeting, again, under prayer, uh, relying on Jehovah's Holy Spirit. Now, when this matter is discussed, the discussion is not rushed, nor is the decision forced. Uh, but often, like in the first century, it's a lively discussion as the brothers feel free to share their opinions and their thoughts, the results of their meditation and their research. But there's also humility there because, again, none of the brothers are trying to force their idea or try to get their thoughts approved, but there is this collective unified uh, desire to see Jehovah's direction on the matter and where is he, where is he steering things. The goal is to discern Jehovah's direction on the matter. And often, or at times we could say, the final result might be quite different than what the research package originally recommended. But that's Jehovah's spirit working through the faithful and discreet slave to bring us to the right decision. Wait, so you are inspired by the Holy Spirit? I'm a bit lost now. And the brothers are looking for a unanimous decision. At times, it may seem like this is a solid adjustment, but if it's not unanimous, it just might not be time yet for it to be revealed. And so it's not forced. The matter is set aside. And it could be that sometime later, even some years later, the matter comes back up and then it sails right through. Uh, or maybe it does get approved, but now with a couple of key points discerned that weren't discerned earlier. This bit is fascinating because Winder just basically admitted that the governing body sometimes leaves some research topics on the back burner for a couple of years until they suddenly decide to pick it up again. Just like a negligent student that tosses his homework on the counter for another day. Raymond Franz, in his book Crisis of Conscience, actually revealed that the governing body did this with issues of conscientious objection. So just to put an example, in the 60s and 70s, a lot of young Jehovah's Witnesses in Spain were being sent to jail because they wouldn't agree to perform alternative civilian service for their country because Watchtower didn't allow them, you know? So Watchtower was receiving a lot of letters uh, from Spain because of these brothers were like, oh, well, we feel comfortable performing civilian service because we're not going to the military. You know, it's just alternative service. So what can we do about it? You know, asking the main branch, you know, can you lift this restriction because we're spending decades of our lives in jail? And what did the governing body do back in New York? Well, since they couldn't come to an anonymous decision on the matter at that moment, the issue was tossed to the side for several years. In the meantime, dozens of young Spanish Jehovah's Witnesses wasted years of their lives in prison, all because of the negligence of the old leaders in New York. Yeah, the governing body would later revisit the topic and allow the Spanish Witnesses to accept alternative service, but they did it way too late. So this is what Jeff is describing. And some of these doctrinal matters have real-life consequences on JWs, and to the governing body, making doctrinal decisions is something that is done on a whim, basically, when they feel it's time to act. Is that not spiritual negligence? <laughs> How is that method of working faithful or discreet? And why would an all-knowing God use such a defective method to share his light to the world Apparently, if a decision is anonymous, it is directed by the Holy Spirit, but if it's not anonymous, it's not directed by the Holy Spirit? Where is any of this in the Bible? Well, with this thorough process, under prayer, and when there is unanimous accord, then the brothers take that as Jehovah's direction and then are happy to share it with the brotherhood. What a load of BS. So this helps us to understand the process, understand how light gets brighter in modern times. 
And while it is interesting to us how our understanding is clarified, what really touches our heart is why it's clarified. Turn with me, please, to the book of Amos, chapter 3. For the sovereign Lord Jehovah will not do a thing unless he has revealed his confidential matter to his servants, the prophets. Doesn't that convey Jehovah's confidence in us? Holy cow, did Jeff just compare himself and his buddies to the prophets of Israel? Well, Mr. Jeff, I guess I'm going to start calling you Prophet Winder now, because if you want the prestige of a prophet, then you must also be ready to receive the ridicule of a false one. So here's a Bible verse for you, Jeff, and for your buddies. And no, this one is not actually taken out of context. This is Moses talking to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy 18.20. If any prophet presumptuously speaks a word in my name that I did not command him to speak, or speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet must die. However, you may say in your heart, how will we know that Jehovah has not spoken the word? When the prophet speaks in the name of Jehovah, and the word is not fulfilled or does not come true, then Jehovah did not speak that word. The prophet spoke it presumptuously. You should not fear him. So, the question is, have the predictions proclaimed by the faithful and discreet slave come true or not? And if they haven't come true, then why would anyone want to listen to them? Does it, doesn't it indicate his love, his loyalty? Jehovah is actively involved in teaching his people, preparing us for what lies ahead. He's providing us with the understanding that we need when we need it. And that is reassuring, isn't it? Because as we progress deeper into the time of the end, as Satan's hatred intensifies and his attacks increase, as we draw closer to the great tribulation and the destruction of Satan's wicked system of things, we can be confident that Jehovah God, our God, will continue to loyally provide us with the direction and the understanding that we need. We will not be left without guidance, unsure where to go or what to do. We will not be left to stumble in the dark, because Jehovah has said, the path of the righteous one is... By means of an angel, Jehovah God told his dear friend Abraham that he was going to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The angel said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is very heavy. Abraham was troubled. He apparently wondered whether Jehovah had taken all of the factors into consideration before he made that decision to destroy the cities. So he asked, will the judge of all the earth not do what is right? But have you ever asked a similar question? Maybe when you were just coming into the truth? Have you ever asked, for example, will none of those who died in the flood get a resurrection, even those who may never have heard of Noah? And what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Will everyone who died in Sodom and Gomorrah sleep an everlasting sleep? The women, the children, babies. We don't have the answer to those questions. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did I hear that right? We don't have an answer to those questions? Finally, mashallah, David Splain says the truth. For once, David finally recognized that since he and his buddies don't actually have access to the mind of God, there is no way of knowing who is going to be resurrected and who won't. But don't let the Splainer fool you. Watchtower has a long history of flip-flopping on this very same question. Sometimes Watchtower has claimed that those who were killed in the flood and Sodom will not be resurrected, and sometimes they have claimed the very opposite. 
Self-Aware NPC did a very excellent video on this topic on how many times Watchtower has flip-flopped on this doctrine and Eric from Barrow and Pickett did the same thing. Both are excellent videos so if you want a brief overview of that whole mess you can go check them out. So I'm not gonna repeat myself but the point is that I mean Watchtower has flip-flopped on this issue so many times that it gives you vertigo. But conveniently, Splained will just kind of forget to mention all the times Watchtower has changed their mind on the matter and pretend that none of these changes ever happened. But we do know one thing. The merciful judge of all the earth will do what is right. Wait a minute. Did I hear that right? We don't have the answer to, to those questions? I thought we did. In the past, our publications have stated that there's no hope of a resurrection for those who died in the flood or those destroyed in Sodom and Gomorrah. But do we really know that? The men of Sodom and Gomorrah were certainly wicked, and they deserved to die for what they did. But did they know any better? How often did Lot and his family preached to them. And are we saying that if special pioneers had been assigned to Sodom, that they would have had no success whatsoever in preaching to the Sodomites, helping them to turn around and come to a knowledge of Jehovah? Can we say dogmatically that not one Sodomite would have repented if Jehovah's requirements had been explained? Just a heads up, my dear viewer, Splain's entire talk is built solely on speculation. <laughs> he speculates that Lot and his family were preaching to the Sodomites somehow, even though the Bible never even hints at such a possibility. Unless by preaching you mean offering your virgin daughters to be abused by a hostile crowd, then yeah, Lot definitely did that. And then David wonders if the Sodomites would have repented if they would have been approached by special pioneers? Like, what the hell are you smoking, David? I hope you didn't plan on sending female pioneers because Lot would just have offered them up to a hostile crowd to be abused. I have two fine ass daughters with tig old bitties who are still virgins, which is quite a remarkable feat in a city where everyone is supposed to be depraved. Look, I shall bring out my daughters and I can gang rape them instead. My treat. This is the one guy you're gonna spare? It's just amazing how David has created this entire canon in his head and just blurts it out as if it was gospel. He has lost his marbles. But what about the disciple Jude's statement that Sodom and Gomorrah would undergo the judicial punishment of everlasting fire? Well, that certainly will prove true of the cities and probably many of the inhabitants as well. But does it mean that there's no hope for any of them? Jesus' statement we just read would indicate that there is hope for some. We just can't be dogmatic. But again, we can say that the merciful judge of all the earth will do what is right. So, if Jehovah always does what is right, why would he destroy people in Sodom only to resurrect them later? That would mean he inflicted unrighteous punishment on these people, right? Now let's talk about the flood of Noah's day. In the past, we've said that any who died in the flood would not be resurrected. But does the Bible say that? Now Noah's contemporaries certainly were wicked. Now, the Bible says that man's wickedness was great on the earth and every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only bad all the time. So those living at that time were sinners. But did they all get a thorough witness? No one his family must have been very busy building the ark. How much time did they have for preaching? And were they able to do seldom worked territory? Splain just keeps applying modern JW terminology to these biblical myths, like what, seldom work territory? Really? It's just so irritating. No, Splain, the Bible never says that Noah was preaching to his contemporaries. It actually says the complete opposite. It says that people of the time 
had no idea that the flood was coming. Uh, we have found that people who live within 10 miles of Bethel have never heard of Jehovah's Witnesses. So can we guarantee that everyone living on earth uh, during that time knew of Noah and what he was doing? We can't really say that. And can we say that if someone had been given an adequate opportunity, he still would have turned his back on Jehovah? We just can't say that. Now, of course, if Jehovah didn't bring them back, they wouldn't have any grounds for complaint. They've had life. And life is more than any of us deserves. Ugh, that is one of the worst teachings in Christianity ever. This notion that since we're all born sinners, we're all deserving of death. Such a backwards way of thinking, I'm sorry, but that way of thinking just kind of justifies all these atrocities that's plain describes in the Bible, like, oh, God just drowned thousands of babies in the flood, but whatever, because those babies were sinners worthy of destruction. Give me a break. As you know, when Adam and Eve sinned, Jehovah could have destroyed them right away, but instead, he gave them the opportunity to have sons and daughters, and as a result, we were born. So the fact that you and I have drawn one breath is pure, undeserved kindness on Jehovah's part. Wow, how merciful. Jehovah doesn't kill us immediately for just existing. Solomon was the second wisest man ever to walk the earth. Jehovah appeared to him twice, and the second time he appeared to him, he said, if you and your sons turn away from following me and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, I will cut Israel off from the surface of the land. What did Solomon do? He began to serve other gods and bow down to them. How will the judge of all the earth view that? That's not for us to say. So we can't be dogmatic about the prospects of those who were said to be buried with their forefathers. It could be that the Bible was just indicating the manner of their burial. Now, that isn't to say that they won't be resurrected. It simply means that we don't know. The righteous judge knows, and we know that he'll do the right thing. Splain, you are finally getting it. So now you admit that after all these years, the governing body had absolutely no reason to decide who will be resurrected and who will not. Which means they were, say it with me, say it with me, Splain, they were Wrong. <laughs> so when are you going to take accountability for these past mistakes? Oh wait, I forgot Prophet Windsor just said that there's no need to apologize. Well, knowing this, then we are not embarrassed about adjustments that are made, uh, nor do is an apology needed for not getting it exactly right previously. <laughs> yes, I can definitely smell shite. <laughs> I mean, Splain repeats over and over again that we shouldn't be dogmatic. But his religion is one of the most dogmatic groups on the planet. I write up there with Scientologists and Islamic fundamentalists. Well, what do we know about Jehovah? Why can we trust him to do the right thing? Well, look at the record. In the days of the prophet Joel, God's people were in a sick spiritual condition. They were worshiping the Baals and the golden calves and sacred poles. They were lying, committing adultery, stealing, shedding innocent blood, oppressing widows and orphans. Jehovah had good reason to wipe the whole nation out. And yet what do we read at Joel 2.13? Joel says, Rip apart your hearts and not your garments, and return to Jehovah your God, for he is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abundant in loyal love and he will reconsider the calamity. He will reconsider the calamity. After all that, Jehovah was willing to show mercy. Now this is very encouraging. Why? Many of our brothers have no trouble accepting the fact that Jehovah will forgive the sins they committed in their ignorance before they came to a knowledge of the truth. 
But if they've committed a sin after baptism, they're afraid that Jehovah will never forget and he will never forgive them. And yet, what do we see here? The nation of Israel was in a dedicated situation before, uh, before Jehovah, and yet Jehovah said, if you stop doing what is wrong, if you start doing what is right, I will reconsider. So the first time I listened to this talk a few weeks ago, I was wondering, what was the point of this talk? Why did David's plane bother to revise his dogma and say that now people of Sodom and the victims of the flood could be resurrected? And now it just hit me, guys, because it's all a pitch to get inactive ones to come back. Splain is focusing so much on Jehovah's aspect of mercy because he wants people to come back to his religion. Of course, this gradual shift towards mercy comes way too late since thousands of JWs have already been ruthlessly expelled thanks to Watchtower's dogmatic policies. So maybe David is verily realizing that rigid discipline is not the best way to keep people invested in your religion. And now he's trying to focus a bit more on mercy and forgiveness. That's my take at least. Maybe I'm wrong. I can't read the minds of these wackos as much as I would like to. Then you have the encouraging words found at Ezekiel 33. Let's read this. And I find that this is a good passage to read to uh, brothers and sisters who may feel that Jehovah could never forgive them for what they've done. Ezekiel 33, verses 14 and 16. And when I say to the wicked one, you will surely die. And he turns away from his sin and does what is just and righteous. Verse 16, none of the sins he committed will be held against him. For doing what is just and righteous, he will surely keep living. Now, isn't that encouraging for someone who strayed from the truth, maybe got involved in some bad conduct, and, and far too many of these are afraid that Jehovah will never forgive them. They would love to come back to the truth. They would love to come back to Jehovah, but they're afraid that Jehovah is not going to accept them. And yet he says, none of the sins he committed will be held against him. Yep, what did I tell you? All these doctrinal revisions are just a way to lure people back into the cult. Who could have seen this coming? The case of King Manasseh makes the point. He was in a dedicated relationship with Jehovah, and yet for most of his life, he did what was wrong. But when he repented, turned around, and started doing what was right, Jehovah wiped the slate clean. What a marvelous, merciful God we worship. They were wicked. They did bad things. They repented. They started to do what was right. And Jehovah wiped the slate clean. Well, today, power for judging has been given to someone else. There's a different judge of all the earth. You. No. If we take the biblical account at face value, then Manasseh was a mass murderer who filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, sacrificed his children to idols, and literally sawed the prophet Isaiah in two. Why would Jehovah forgive such a psychopath? Is this the same God that destroyed 70,000 Israelites because David carried out a census at the wrong time? Are we still talking about the same merciful judge, Splain? Jesus? has been given authority to judge the living and the dead. Well, can we trust him? Can we be sure that Jesus will be merciful? Absolutely. He's the exact image of his Father. And the prophet Isaiah wrote of him, He will not judge by what appears to his eyes, nor reprove simply according to what his ears hear. He will judge the lowly with fairness, and with uprightness he will give reproof in behalf of the meek ones of the earth. Well, David, I hope your Watchtower lawyers can defend you in Judgment Day because you have a lot of accounting to do. And I hope JC is in a silly good mood when he judges you. The authority that Jesus has been given includes the authority to resurrect the dead. He's the resurrection and the life. Now, you know, we often say that Jehovah God knows everything about those who have died. And that's true. But since Jesus is doing the resurrecting, it's reasonable to conclude that he also knows everything about the dead and the living. 
and he's going to be able to resurrect them accurately. Now, whether he'll share the power to resurrect with his anointed brothers when they're raised to heaven remains to be seen. We'll stay tuned. Wait, 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 bro. Stephen Lett already claimed that the anointed will gain the power to resurrect people. Well, Jesus and his 144,000 associate kings will have the power to completely empty the grave, the common grave of dead mankind by means of the resurrection. Did you miss that new light or what? Or was Stephen Lett just being way too dogmatic for your liking? Well, what's the takeaway from this talk so far? How would you explain it to someone who wasn't here today? You would not say, some in, who died in Sodom and Gomorrah and in the flood are going to be resurrected, and Solomon isn't going to be resurrected. No, 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 you wouldn't say that. <laughs> what we're saying is that we shouldn't be dogmatic about who will and who will not be resurrected. We just don't know. But we trust Jehovah God, we trust Jesus Christ, that they will do what is right. I know what you're thinking. The wheels are turning. And you're saying to yourself, come on, come on. We've talked about the flood. We've talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. But what about the Great Tribulation? Is there anything that we can or can't say about that? You know, that's a good question. We should talk about that. You know what? I think my time is up. <laughs> yeah, just keep us in suspense, you bastard. Look at his mug little face. Oh yeah, Jeffrey, I got him real good, didn't I? I'm such a comedic genius. Thank you, Daddy Splain, for reminding us that a bunch of your previous dogmas, teachings that you treated as absolute fact, never actually had any basis on the scriptures. So now, you should follow your own advice and stop being dogmatic when it comes to the blood policy and the disfellowshipping arrangement and please stop being dogmatic with your hair because that atrocious combover is definitely not the answer. And that man is a goner. like I have to finish Brother Spain's talk. <laughs> and I don't think you want me to talk about anything else. <laughs> so what is the takeaway point up to this time? I'm sure we got the point. It's helped us to think about our loving Heavenly Father Jehovah as the merciful judge of the entire earth and his son Jesus Christ. Yes, we can trust them to make proper judgments. We know that Jehovah and Jesus can read hearts. Ooh, can they also read the writing on the wall? Because you're about to undo a century of sacred teachings in less than 20 minutes. I have my popcorn ready, Jackson. And they have a long record of living by the perfect standards of justice that Jehovah has set up. So, what about the future judgments during the Great Tribulation. Is there something that we can adjust with regard to our understanding? Well, before we start to do that, let's be quite frank. Over the last few years, we've had a few changes with regard to the events that occurred during the Great Tribulation. And if you've been in the truth for a while, sometimes it's a bit hard to remember, was that what we used to believe or <laughs> is this what we believe now? It's baffling how even Jeffrey acknowledges the fact that they've revised their doctrines so many times, it's difficult to keep track of all the changes. I was only a baptized publisher for like 8 years, and I remember all the changes they did to their eschatology back then. I mean, I can't imagine all the old timers in the audience and, and all the changes that they've witnessed throughout the years. I wonder how they feel about all those doctrinal flip-flops for poor souls. So I don't think this is a laughing matter, Jackson. You know, people have bet their lives on this dogma. What the fuck are you laughing about? So to help us to make sure that we've got some idea 
of some of the events that occur during the Great Tribulation, let's look at this review. What event starts the Great Tribulation? The destruction of Babylon the Great. That will be the time when the political powers turn on the world empire of false religion, showing their disgust for this symbolic prostitute. This will lead to the destruction of all false religious organizations. <laughs> yeah, man, good luck convincing all those Muslim theocracies around the world to start burning down their sacred spaces. Is that the blue mosque? Jesus. Uh, sorry, but there's a bigger chance of Mark Sanderson going to the gym than of this ever happening. What event ends the Great Tribulation? The Battle of Armageddon. That will be the final part of the Great Tribulation. Jesus, along with the resurrected 144,000 and myriads of angels, will battle with all those who oppose Jehovah, his kingdom, and his people here on earth. This will be the war of the great day of God the Almighty. I just can't with this picture. Horses versus tanks. <laughs> hey, Michael Bay, could you turn this into a movie, please? Now that we have the start and the end of the Great Tribulation in mind, let's ask a few more questions. How long will that time period be from start to finish? The answer is, we don't know. We do know that many events are foretold to happen during that time period. But these events may all occur in a reasonably short period of time. For this discussion though, let's focus on the few events that will occur toward the end of the Great Tribulation. When does the attack of Gog of Magog occur? It doesn't occur at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, but toward the end of that period of time. This attack on God's people by a coalition of nations will lead right into the Battle of Armageddon. So Gog's attack will occur just prior to Armageddon. When will the remaining ones of the anointed be gathered and taken to heaven? The Bible book of Ezekiel indicates that when Gog of Magog starts his attack, some of the anointed will still be here on earth. Another silly picture. Oh yes, the most powerful world governments are going to get together to spy on Samuel Heard, just I guess to make sure he took his medication or something, and to analyze Watchtower magazines, which only come out like once a year now. Yeah, this is totally going to happen, guys. However, Revelation 17:14 tells us that when Jesus battles with the nations, he will come with those who are called and chosen. That is all of the resurrected 144,000. So the final gathering of his chosen ones must occur after the start of the attack of Gog of Magog and before the Battle of Armageddon. This means that the anointed will be gathered and taken to heaven toward the end of the Great Tribulation, not at the beginning. When will the final judgment of the sheep and the goats take place? Again, although we can't be dogmatic as to the exact sequence of events, it appears that the final judgment takes place at the end of the Great Tribulation. We can't be dogmatic about this event, but let's dogmatically put it at the end of the timeline because why not? You dense frog. First, Jesus' judgment of the sheep and the goats and the destruction of the wicked will take place at the end of the Great Tribulation. Second, there will be some of the remaining ones of the anointed on earth until the start of the attack of Gog of Magog, right at the end of the Great Tribulation. Third, the judgment of the sheep and the goats will include their dealings with Christ's brothers even during the Great Tribulation. So people are going to be judged on the way they treat Christ's brothers? which in the mind of Jeffrey just means the governing body. I thought salvation only came by believing in Jesus. So can an atheist that supports the governing body make it into paradise? Or am I just asking the wrong questions? So that is a review of what we already believe. So if you were writing down notes, oh, there's a new point. Be careful what you say to others. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but 
how do these basic facts, when we look at the things that occurred toward the end of the Great Tribulation, how do they affect our understanding of Jehovah's judgments by means of Jesus Christ? Well, we know that the closer we get to the Great Tribulation, the clearer our understanding is of what will occur. Yes, our understanding is clarified according to the proper time, and also in a way that will help us not only to endure the Great Tribulation, but also to prosper during that period of time. So what we're going to do is consider four very interesting questions. The first question is, once the Great Tribulation starts, so we saw there in the chart with the destruction of Babylon the Great, so once it starts, is there a door of opportunity for non-believers to actually join us in serving Jehovah? Is there a door of opportunity? What have we said in the past? We've said, no, there will not be an opportunity for people to join us at that time. Now, why did we say that? Well, basically, we viewed the account of the flood as being a type and anti-type uh, portrayal, and that we forethought the fact that the door of the ark was closed prior to the flood coming indicated that the door of opportunity would close once the Great Tribulation started. Yeah, it's true. Watchtower has been teaching for decades now that once the Great Tribulation starts, there's no chance for people to repent and become JWs. As recently as the Ezekiel book, you know, the uh, pure worship book that JW studied like three years ago, that spiritual food was explicit in saying that only people that entered into the Great Tribulation as true worshipers, aka Jehovah's Witnesses, would be marked for survival. Only those who pursue such a course now and who enter the Great Tribulation as pure worshipers will be in a position to be marked for survival. This couldn't have been any more clear. But, of course, it's true Jesus did compare the time of Noah with the presence of, uh, of him as a reigning king. But notice Jesus didn't say anything that indicated this was a type anti type arrangement, and he certainly didn't mention anything with regard to a door of opportunity closing. Once again, the governing body is recognizing that one of their previous teachings had no biblical backing. I'm quite impressed, although Jeffrey is being a bit disingenuous here because it has already been a couple of years since Watchtower abandoned all that type and anti-type nonsense, so the changes they are making today are not really the result of abandoning this theological framework. It's been a couple of years now, you know? There has to be another reason for this change. So let's think about that question again. Once the Great Tribulation starts, is there a door of opportunity still available? Well, to answer that, looking at this time chart, remember the judgment of the sheep and the goats, the final judgment occurs when? Not at the beginning, but towards the end of the Great Tribulation. So let's think about some that we know, perhaps Unbelieving relatives, disfellowshipped ones, others that have heard the message, perhaps studied with us, could some of them, once they see the destruction of Babylon the Great, decide that what Jehovah's Witnesses were saying is correct after all? Could they take a stand for the truth? Yes, Jeffrey, of course they would. If the United Nations, an organization which is just famous for doing nothing, <laughs> yeah, somehow managed to destroy all organized religions, that would be overwhelming proof that Jehovah's Witnesses were right all along. If that happened today, my brother in Christ, I would go to Bethel myself and apologize to you and your buddies because, damn, that would be overwhelming evidence of the Jehovah's Witness teachings. But now, I don't believe this kind of event will ever happen, it's pretty impossible at the moment, but if it did, then yeah, Jeffrey, we would all become Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, if they changed their hearts and joined us, would we be disappointed? 
Now, we can't be dogmatic. <laughs> but we don't want to be like Jonah. <laughs> and say, so, oh, no, no, the door's closed. Mm -mm 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 -mm. No, no. Mm -hmm. And Exodus 12, 38 says, And a vast mixed company also went with them. Now, do you notice there's a footnote there, and what does it say? That is, a mixed company of non-Israelites, including Egyptians. So, what happened? Well, during the time when the ten plagues came upon the Egyptians, obviously some of these Egyptians started to see the distinction between Jehovah and the false gods that they worshipped. So when decision time came and the Israelites were leaving Egypt, some of these Egyptians joined the Israelites. Now, isn't that interesting for us to note? But, of course, we might be thinking, yes, well, I understand why we said what we did before, but is it really the case that all these ones that we've studied with or so on, some of them may have a chance to join us after Babylon the Great is destroyed. Is that fair? <laughs> Last minute repentance. Of course it's not fair. These old timers in your audience have worked their ass off for decades, making sure they're spiritually ready for the arrival of the Great Tribulation, only for you to flip the carpet off their feet and tell them that last minute repentance is fine? Damn man, way to piss off your oldest crowd. Jeffrey, who, you know, must I remind you, also happen to be your biggest donors. But you see, are we imitating the merciful judge of all the earth? Really, we shouldn't be surprised if that were to happen, should we? And think about it. As we looked in the time chart, we saw that this is a time period prior to the final judgment. So anyone who takes their stand for Jehovah early in the Great Tribulation will still face the attack of Gog of Magog, and that will be a very, very difficult time. So in a similar way, our preaching work today is of utmost importance. We see it says in verse 13, For everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. However, how will they call on him if they have not put faith in him? How in turn will they put faith in him about whom they have not heard? How in turn will they hear without someone to preach? Do you see why our preaching work is so urgent and important today? Yes, many take the opportunity to make a decision right now. But could it be that once the Great Tribulation starts, many who have heard the message that Jehovah's Witnesses have preached may be in a position then to make the right decision? the right choice. With these new changes, the preaching work is actually less important now because before, people had to put faith in the message before the Great Tribulation started. The point of the preaching work was to make converts so you could save them. But now unbelievers can wait until they see actual evidence of JW teachings so they can repent last minute. So what do we need the preaching work for? I mean, sure, Jeffrey argues that people will need to know about Jehovah's Witnesses so they can know who to go to once the Great Tribulation starts, but I mean, come on, if all religions were suddenly destroyed overnight, wouldn't it just become common knowledge that Jehovah's Witnesses were right? You know, that kind of news would spread like wildfire all over the world, so why doesn't Big J just bring the Great Tribulation now so that everyone in the world has actual evidence that Jehovah's Witnesses have the truth, the one true religion. I think that would be much more effective method of conversion than sending people door knocking on a Saturday morning. Well again, we can't be dogmatic, but we certainly hope that that would be the case. Now while we're talking about this, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. What do we mean? Well, you know, some of us in the past, we're not going to mention names, <laughs> but you know, some of us have said, oh, you know, my, my unbelieving relative, or, uh, you know, I hope he dies before the Great Tribulation. Aha, uh -huh, we know what you've been saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, because if he dies before the Great Tribulation, he'll have a chance of a resurrection. But during? Mm -mm. <laughs> but let's think about that. 
You see, does someone's eternal salvation depend on when they die? <laughs> or does it depend on really their heart condition? You see, the merciful judge of the earth knows their heart condition. And really, what are we thinking if we ask that question? You know, are we imagining Jehovah saying to Jesus, look, uh, this person, you know, they really should die forever. But look at it, they died now before the Great Tribulation. Oh, no, we have to resurrect them. <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> really? Again? Really? Yeah, you laugh about it now, you big doofus, but you're poking fun at the long-held beliefs of so many of your followers. Of course, I know it's a silly belief, Jeffrey, but it doesn't make it any less cruel that you just stand there all gloated and laugh in the face of your brothers. Huh, you thought your mom is going to resurrect just because she died before the Great Tribulation? You asshole. You and your buddies were the ones that made JWs believe that all that nonsense in the first place. See, Jehovah is the righteous, merciful judge. He knows people's hearts. You can't fool him or trick him. So that was the first question. I'm sure you found interesting. Yeah? Once the Great Tribulation starts, does the door of opportunity close? The answer is, well, we'll have to wait and see. But according to the scriptures, it is a possibility that some can make a stand for the truth. So there's no point in being a Jehovah's Witness then. What's the point of going out in service, of following all the rules, of attending all the meetings, if you could just live a normal life now and turn to Jehovah once there's actual proof of the Great Tribulation? The whole point of being a Jehovah's Witness was to be prepared to survive the Great Tribulation. That was the driving force behind everything you did. But now that Jeffrey has destroyed that, there's no point. Second question, when does the preaching of the good news of the kingdom finish? Good question. First start, let's remember, the good news is only good news to us and those who accept it. As Psalm 2 mentions, though, for the rest of the world, it's never been good news, has it? So what does Matthew 24, 14 tells us, tell us? It tells us that the good news is going to be preached and then the end will come. Let's look at our timeline again. What is the end referred to there? Well, it's the final part of the Great Tribulation. So that means that during the Great Tribulation, the good news of the kingdom will still be preached. And it's still good news to us, but not to the rest of the world. That good news will become more hard-hitting as time goes on, causing people to make a decision one way or the other, whether they accept the kingdom or not. So isn't that yet another reason why we shouldn't be surprised that some may make a stand for the truth even during the Great Tribulation? Jeffrey just keeps muddying the waters, this absolute mad lad. What happened to the heart-hitting judgment message you were hyping up for years now? Is that cancelled? Because the previous understanding was that, you know, JWs would preach the good news of salvation before the Great Tribulation, but once Babylon the Great was destroyed, that message of salvation would turn into a message of judgment where Jehovah's Witnesses would go out and tell people, oh, you're screwed, there's no chance of repentance now, that was the hailstone message you were preaching, you were thinking about. But now Jeffrey is saying that the message of good news will gradually change into a more harsh message and a lot of people are gonna accept it and convert last minute? What's going on here? Jeffrey, you promised that the closer we get to the Great Tribulation, the clearer things would become. Well, we know that the closer we get to the Great Tribulation, the clearer our understanding is of what will occur. But all you have done is muddy the waters. You have undone decades of eschatological development. You bagel. Your religion was proud to have all the answers, but now all you say is, we don't know. Is that your new favorite line? We don't know. And we can't be dogmatic. Well, again, we can't be dogmatic. So we can't be dogmatic about those ones. We don't 
know. We simply don't know. We can't be dogmatic. And we shouldn't be dogmatic because we don't know. Are you a broken record? Stop sabotaging your own cult. The third question. All those who die during the Great Tribulation, will they go into eternal death and never be resurrected? Well, initially we can say the goats, they're not going to be resurrected, are they? Because uh, they're going to everlasting cutting off, according to what Jesus said. You see, these ones who are judged as goats, those who receive everlasting destruction, obviously have had adequate opportunity, have had a full opportunity to accept or reject the kingdom. But what about those prior to that final judgment? So the Great Tribulation starts. We're not sure how long it goes, but each day that goes on, there's people who no doubt will die. Do you realize every day worldwide, about 150,000 people die? either of natural causes, of wars, sicknesses, and so on. So what about those ones? They're not actually killed by Jehovah as a punishment. So what do we need to remember? The merciful judge knows, knows who should be resurrected and who shouldn't be resurrected. So we can't be dogmatic about those ones who may die at that time. We know that Jehovah and Jesus will do the right thing. Well, 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 Jeffrey finally recognized what the XJW community has been saying all this time. JWs have not preached the good news throughout the inhabited earth. And every day that Armageddon is delayed, more people die. And what's the point of preaching if people that don't hear the Watchtower message will be resurrected anyways? Wouldn't it be better to not preach to them? so that they make it into paradise? Because if you preach to someone and they reject your message, you pretty much just condemn them to death. So might as well save people's lives by not preaching to them. Just stay home and watch some Netflix. Now, another final interesting question. Will all those living during the Great Tribulation have a full opportunity to decide either for the kingdom or against it? How would you answer? Don't say it out loud. The simple answer is, we don't know. And we don't need to know, because we're not the judges. It's above our pay grade. Then why have you been printing all these dogmas, you silly marmot? But now there may be a little voice in you saying, but why don't we know? You know, I mean, I've always believed hmm? during that time, that's it. But you see, each day, we mentioned 150,000 people on average die, 350,000 new babies are born each day. So even if the Great Tribulation was only a few days long, each day you've got more babies being born. And what about areas where the good news hasn't reached to the greatest extent? Maybe in lands where our work is restricted. We might be wondering, well, will we get to preach to every individual? Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, if you look at it later, seems to indicate maybe we won't. So now here's an interesting question. Is it reasonable for us to say that Jehovah and Jesus automatically label millions of people as goats, even though they have never had a full opportunity to respond. Damn, this is huge. Since the days of Rutherford, a major belief of Jehovah's Witnesses has been that it is necessary for JWs to preach in all the inhabited earth before the end comes. No preaching, no Armageddon. Watchtower constantly boasted on the idea that JWs were the only religious group preaching in every country. But as I have pointed out multiple times in this channel now, Jehovah's Witnesses have never even come close to preaching in all the inhabited earth. Most of the people living in the Middle East, India, China, Southeast Asia, and Papua New Guinea have never even heard of Jehovah's Witnesses. Hell, 
Most Muslims, Buddhists, and Hindus have never even opened up a Bible. And even in lands where Jehovah's Witnesses have had some measure of success, such as the United States, most of the population actually has no idea what they're preaching. <laughs> they get confused with Mormons all of the time. Even David's plain acknowledged the failure of the preaching work in his last talk. Uh, we have found that people who live within 10 miles of Bethel have never heard of Jehovah's Witnesses. So no, Jeffrey, Jehovah's Witnesses have never given a witness throughout the entire earth, and they probably never will. It's impossible. It's just too many people, uh, too many tribes, too many isolated areas. No one has done it. This religion is so insignificant in the global stage that half of the world's population has no idea who JWs are. But what's so shocking about all this is that this is the first time a governing body member recognizes the limits of the preaching work. It seems to me that somewhere in Jeffrey's dark gargoyle heart, his humanity has kicked in and he can't imagine Jehovah destroying billions of people who never had a chance to learn about him. He said it himself, giving a throw witness is no longer a requirement for Armageddon. But what Jeffrey doesn't realize is that he just acknowledged defeat. Jehovah's Witnesses have failed at the one task they were sent to do, preach throughout all of the earth. It was never a reality, and it never will be a reality. Interesting question. If they haven't had a full opportunity, and they die at that time, is it possible that they may receive a resurrection as unrighteous persons? What's the answer? We simply don't know. We can't be dogmatic. And we shouldn't be dogmatic because we don't know. But rather, let's take comfort in what we do know. And what do we know? We know that Jehovah and Jesus are merciful, that they will always do the right thing. In Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, what does it say? Jehovah takes no delight in the death of a wicked person. He wants them to change. And we know that Jehovah and Jesus will judge each individual in a balanced, righteous, and merciful way. Well, now at this point, you think, Wow, that's a lot to take in. Maybe your hands are a little tired from taking notes. Don't worry. An upcoming watchtower uh, is going to give us all the details on this, so stay tuned. <laughs> but in the meantime, what do we need to keep doing? We need to keep preaching the message to as many people as possible. We have no idea what results may come from that. And as we keep on preaching, remember... Leave the judging to Jehovah and Jesus. They will always do the right thing, the merciful and just thing. Of that, we can be absolutely confident. My dear viewer, we are now witnessing the end of the Jehovah's Witness religion. I don't mean to say that Watchtower is going to cease to exist. No, Watchtower is going to be here for decades to come. But the religion of our grandparents, the religion of our parents, is dead now. And the governing body has killed it. Unbelievers can now repent after the start of the Great Tribulation, after they see undeniable evidence of Watchtower's predictions coming true. The whole point of being a Jehovah's Witness was belonging to a select group of people who had exclusive knowledge of the end and an exclusive claim to salvation. All of that is gone now. In my previous video, I illustrated that effective doomsday cults always place the last chance of salvation before the start of the visible end time signs. So if Jeffrey and his buddies had two collective brain cells between them, they would just scrap this entire talk and pretend it never happened, and they would just go back to saying that the chance to be saved ends once the Great Tribulation starts. You know, like it was just a couple of weeks ago. But it seems that the governing body are not even good at being cult leaders. Because the ironic part 
is that their human compassion just got the best of them. They realized, yeah, these dark souls, these nasty men who are willing to just cover up atrocities, somewhere in their dark hearts have realized that a just and loving God would never destroy 8 billion people for the crime of being on the wrong religion. That's why they have decided to extend the chance of salvation beyond the Great Tribulation. But by doing that, they have destroyed one of the most fundamental doctrines of the religion, and one which was very effective in keeping its members in the hamster wheel of activity. In their efforts to focus more on compassion and forgiveness, the governing body has done away with their religion, and now it's something unrecognizable. What a thing to witness. And there's one more angle I would like to cover in this entire mess because this change in doctrine might also have some sort of pragmatic motive as well, you know? Because the governing body is pretty much aware that the outside world sees Jehovah's Witnesses as this dogmatic cult that believes only they will be saved, you know? That's a very common point of criticism. Oh yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses say that they're the only ones who are gonna be saved. So with this change, the governing body can now say, hey, look, we're not saying we're the only ones who can be saved. Now people can repent last minute, so we're not being so dogmatic and we're not being so extreme. Uh, that may be another reason, you know? Uh, I don't know, I'm, I just can't read the minds of these bozos, but, uh, you know, some food for thought. Who knows the exact reason why they decided to make these changes, but uh, there must there must have been a powerful one. It's gonna take some time to see the effects this new doctrine will have on the religion, but my guess is it's not gonna be good for membership numbers. Jackson just gave all 8 million of his followers a free pass to relax and slack off on the preaching work. And this new doctrine, combined with the dropping of our requirements for publishers and the general drop in seal we've seen in common witnesses, you know, during COVID, uh, yeah, this is not gonna be good for the religion. The governing body has opened Pandora's box and they're not gonna be able to close it anymore. And boy, I'm actually really excited to see what happens with all these changes. <laughs> Rims of the wheels of the chariot as having eyes all around. All seeing Jehovah directs everything. What is the speed of Jehovah's chariot? Well, in the Bible, verse 14, chapter 1, it describes its movements in comparison with flashes of lightning. Now, a flash of lightning travels at 186,000 miles per second, the speed of light. But if we think about it, Jehovah's chariot's a lot faster than that. In fact, we could say it travels at the speed of thought. There is nothing faster than the speed of light, Stephen. Thoughts are the product of synapses firing in your brain. And although these reactions are super fast, they're nowhere near as fast as the speed of light. But of course, there's no way for Stephen to know this because he barely uses any of his brain cells anyways. At the speed of Jehovah's thought. And obviously that would be immeasurably fast. Now we can't see into the invisible realm and see how Jehovah is using the heavenly part of his organization with lightning speed to accomplish his will and purpose. But we can see how fast things are moving in the visible part of Jehovah's organization. And that only makes sense, doesn't it? Because the earthly part is closely related to the heavenly and uh, is actually a reflection of the heavenly part of Jehovah's organization. I love how Stephen doesn't even bother anymore quoting Bible verses to just support what he just said. Well, Stephen, if Jehovah's celestial chariot is a reflection of his earthly organization, then that chariot is probably stuck in a celestial ditch. Now, the foregoing discussion brings us to what Brother Cook mentioned, our updates, two fast-moving projects that uh, Jehovah obviously is directing and uh, we're gonna get brought up to speed. Uh, you like the way I use that, right? right? Up to speed since we're, <laughs> we're talking about uh, moving. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! 
but things are happening, and Jehovah certainly is directing matters. And as mentioned, we're going to have an update regarding the audio video facility being built at Ramapo, New York. Now, you probably recall that it's being built on property that the organization already owned. And it's conveniently located only two miles from our World Headquarters facility at Warwick. And a very interesting side point, the governing body tried for several years really hard to sell this property with absolutely no results. Then we came to realize this is ideal property to build a much needed facility that can consolidate onto one site the functions currently being done on many different properties, one site to produce our audio, video, and uh, beautiful artwork. So just another example of Jehovah's eyes seeing things. What? So you tried really hard for years to sell this property and failed to do so, and that was a result of Jehovah's blessing? And when you do manage to sell property, that's also a result of Jehovah's blessing? Oh, so you can basically turn any mundane event into evidence that Jehovah's backing you up. Well, Stephen, today I had a very successful shit in my toilet. Was that because of Jehovah's blessing too? Hallelujah. Jehovah lovingly, obviously, is directing things. But I'm sure you'd like to see this video now that will give you an update on what uh, is happening there at uh, Ramapo. So enjoy the video. Now Stephen is going to show us a sneak peek into what's going down in upstate New York. Oh boy, what exciting developments are, are we about to see? The specific purpose of the Ramapo project is to bring all media facilities under one roof. In the state of New York, there's only a certain season where you can take trees down. We're only allowed to remove trees between November and the end of March. And the town board approved the special permit for us to be able to cut the trees. However, when we went to exercise that permit, we realized that another agency still had to give their permission for us to be able to use it, which we didn't get to be able to cut those trees. And then somehow something in the permitting language opened our eyes to a new possibility that allowed us to take the trees down in a different way. We got permission to cut the trees, but we had to cut the trees all by hand. And in four weeks, we used an outside contractor to take down all the trees that we needed. Two weeks early of the end of the tree cutting season. Wow, Jehovah's Witnesses exploited loopholes to destroy acres of land in order to build more cold compounds. Are these the same people who are supposed to turn the earth into a paradise? Then we get a few interviews of all those unpaid laborers that uh, abandoned their jobs to work for free saying how great the experience has been and how any little thing that happens is evidence of Big J's blessings. For us to be at Ramapo was the, one of the most amazing privileges we've ever had, but we're still working for Jehovah and, and right in the center of his organization. The facility has been designed and will be constructed in such a way that if modifications need to be made later to keep up with technology, we won't have to deconstruct the building in order to implement those changes. We've developed beautiful studios that will be functional not only now, but also for future projects. How many projects are you planning on churning out before Armageddon arrives, Stephen? One exciting feature of the Media Center will be the use of video walls for virtual production. In fact, we've already begun filming with this new technology here at Patterson. With these video walls, we can create digitally backgrounds that can be used to give the appearance that we are shooting it in uh, a foreign location. Jehovah's Witnesses learn how to use the green screen. This is big brain time. The governing body made it very clear that their focus was the spirituality of those who are involved in our productions. If the friends have to be off site for long periods of time filming, it can really disrupt their spiritual routine. Virtual production will allow us to reduce the need to travel or to even work hours that could interfere with spiritual activities. Watchtower only wants spiritually strong people filming in their propaganda because it's a pain to have to erase them from the footage once they get this fellowship. Contractors have been very busy removing the trees, taking them out, uh, clearing the site in preparation for other work that will come and uh, all of this preceding this huge construction project that is looming just ahead. 
just a few months from now, we plan, Jehovah willing, with Jehovah's blessing, we're going to call in many more volunteers to help us to move this project forward speedily. But dear brothers and sisters, please remember to pray for Jehovah's blessings on these efforts. Say no more, Stephen. Okay, guys, time to pray. Daddy Jehovah, please continue blessing the unpaid laborers in New York who are currently freezing their ass off trying to finish these buildings under the governing body's deadlines. We pray that you continue to delay Armageddon so we can build more stuff for you and that you give us the wisdom to continue to find legal loopholes to cut more trees. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. But now, as we said, we had another update and that's concerning the exciting project that is going on in Australia. And as you know, it's the series of dramas entitled The Good News According to Jesus. That title makes no sense. Jesus never wrote anything down. So how could it be the good news according to Jesus? It would be the good news according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Not according to Jesus. Please enjoy this video update. Now we go to the land down under, where Watchtower has been building their main movie studio and we see how they managed to get a hold of animals and how they built some of these sets and how they even traveled to Israel, <coughs> occupied Palestine, to film some of these scenes. A small crew traveled to Israel and actually filmed in the real Judean wilderness. The local branch office provided support, a number of scenes were filmed, and now when we're reviewing the material, we see Jehovah blessing that arrangement. I mean, all of this could not have been cheap, so no wonder Watchtower always begs for money. While construction was going, a contractor came in to the back lot to see the construction brothers. He spoke to one of the brothers in tears and asked, what was this all about? And we explained what we were trying to achieve. And with tears, he said, I come from Israel and this looks just like my home. That makes zero sense. Was that contractor a time traveler from first century Jerusalem? Because I don't think modern Jerusalem looks like this, does it? I haven't been, but I don't think so. So I would bet my left nut, this conversation never happened. This is a world that you've never seen before. Oh my God, bro. Oh, hell. Seeing someone who has no idea about this project to come in and see how accurate it was, uh, really shows me how Jehovah's really looking after this project. It isn't any one of us that have made this a success. It's Jehovah the whole way. As we study these Bible accounts and figure out ways to bring them to life on the screen, it's teaching us to get into the motivations of who these people were. Our goal is to take them from being just characters in black and white on the printed page into real people that you're gonna know and love for the rest of your life. Was that a threat? You are going to fall in love with these semi-fictional characters, where whether you like it or not. All right then. When we recount the tremendous amount of work that is being done to visually portray, depict the gospels of Jesus' life and ministry, we're thrilled. We're absolutely amazed. And all of this work and investment is not just for one convention drama. In fact, this production sets us up for convention dramas for years to come in the future. And you're going to truly enjoy them as uh, they're rolled out. So much for the end being just around the corner, right? But at least Steven is going to provide me with decades of whitewashed gospel dramas to tear apart. I just know these Jesus episodes are going to be injected with modern Jehovah's Witness lingo. I can feel it. Just wait until they reveal Jesus was actually a regular pioneer and that the apostles preached using an early form of literature cards. Does it sound too dumb to be true? Never underestimate Watchtower's ability to ruin their Bible stories. We already have good Jesus movies and good Jesus TV series like The Chosen. That one is pretty nice. Even a wicked unbeliever like me can appreciate it because it's well produced and because the actors come from diverse religious backgrounds. 
But the fact that everyone working in this new Jesus movie is a devout Jehovah's Witness is just a recipe for disaster. It's built in an echo chamber. This is gonna be a dogmatic, revisionist, bastardized version of the Gospels. And I can't wait to tear it to shreds. In fact, we've prepared a preview of those two convention dramas. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it. It's a short uh, preview. I know it's really early to show you something for the 2024 convention. And I hope I don't get into trouble with the governing body for showing this prematurely. Just kidding. I hope you don't think I'm that stupid. <laughs> I love you, Stephen Led. You just keep handing me down these precious meme materials to be used in the future. You know this is going to be a classic. I hope you don't think I'm that stupid. <laughs> it, it is with the governing body's full blessing and approval that we show you Holy cow, why are they clapping? This crowd is just so enamored by Stephen Lett. I'm surprised they haven't erected statues of him at this point. Behold, the Watchtower Golden Calf. I mean, cheap. Bah. So please enjoy this governing body approved <laughs> teaser for these two dramas. Seeing that many have undertaken to compile an account of the facts, I resolved also, because I have traced all things from the start with accuracy. Do not be afraid, Mary. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus. Let Jehovah be praised, the God of Israel, because he has turned his attention to his people and has brought them deliverance. For look, I'm declaring to you good news. For today, there was born to you in David's city a savior who is Christ, the Lord. Look, Jehovah's slave girl. May it happen to me according to your declaration. the true light that gives light to every sort of man was about to come into the world. So, what did he think? I think it looks painfully average, like something you would watch on an Easter day on TV 12 years ago. The light effects still look really unpolished, the beards look Terrible. Why couldn't they allow the actress to grow an actual beard? It didn't even have to be that long and just make the excuse that they're filming. Wouldn't that be acceptable to Jehovah? Wouldn't Jehovah allow that sacrifice to be done f to make a movie that looks good? But no, we have to use fake beards and waste hours of precious time in the makeup department putting on these fake beards that still look fake. And couldn't they find an actual newborn for this scene? Like, was it that difficult? <laughs> Overall, it looks fine, but I would really expect more from God's one true religion, I really would. Because how come the Jesus movies produced by Babylon the Great look much better than this? The dramas 
over the next several years will have this kind of realism and will truly bring the gospel account to life, the good news according to Jesus. Now, what you saw was just a two and a half minute uh, a teaser, a video, little video. But uh, as we mentioned, we're going to, and that was just for episode one, but we are actively, speedily, fast movingly uh, preparing more episodes. In fact, you'll be happy to know that we're working right now on the next four episodes after the, the two that, uh, uh, the one really, a uh, teaser of the one you saw. Four more are being worked on. And episode three is almost totally finished. We've almost got episode three uh, done. The governing body has already been uh, reviewing episode one and an early edition of episode two. And uh, how powerful indeed uh, they are. I love how all these projects must have the governing body stamp of approval before they're released because the governing body is like the FDA of cult propaganda for some reason. And I know personally, I can say that I've been inspired, I've been motivated, and even brought to the point of tears several times and other governing body brothers and helpers were affected similarly. The realism, the impact, the power is absolutely amazing. Well, we're confident that you appreciate receiving these two very important updates concerning significant, fast-moving projects. And the governing body wants to keep you fully informed. They really want you to be up to date because we need your prayers, we need your support, and we want you to know what is happening. And that we're confident that with Jehovah's blessing, then uh, this is going to be something that's going to benefit the spiritual brotherhood in a tremendous, a profound way. Yep, Stephen, because I'm sure that your Jesus fanfiction is somehow going to slow down the demise of your religion. And uh, we, we're just so anxious to be able to give you more of this, even though we gave you what we could uh, now. But some might ask, why are we embarking on two projects like this when the new world is so close? Excellent question, mate. We might not even finish one of them. The end may come. Well, we just don't know, do we? We don't know exactly when the end is going to come. Wait, what the fuck is going down at Bethel? Did Stephen Lett actually read his Bible this time and realize that putting a time for the end is completely ludicrous? This is the same guy that three years ago claimed that we were living in the final part of the last days, surely the final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last day of the last day. So what happened? I don't know what's happening anymore. Uh, here's a, an illustration. How many carefully selected smooth stones did David take out when he went to fight Goliath? He took five, didn't he? How many did he need? One. He just didn't know, did he? So he, he was prepared, uh, what it, whatever it took. Well, the same way, we don't know when the end is going to come. Now, here's another thought, food for thought. Could not these projects, if needed, be finished after the Great Tribulation and then used powerfully in the New World? And thinking of the Good News According to Jesus episodes, would they not be wonderful tools to teach resurrected ones about God's Son? Well, only Jehovah knows. Time will tell. So JWs are going to be using the Jesus movie to teach billions of resurrected people instead of, you know, opening up a Bible and reading the gospel accounts. <laughs> Sorry, Big J, your holy word is not enough for Stephen Led. Apparently, we need movies now or people won't understand what you're trying to teach them in the gospels. But what did the Watchtower say some years ago about the activity of Jehovah's people right when the end would come. Here's what it said, let me read you this quote. Quoting the Watchtower as if it was a holy text, I love it. The arrival of the Lord Jesus to execute judgment will come at a complete surprise, even to Jehovah's people, for it will no doubt find them at their busiest time of activity. So uh, we're gonna be surprised, we're gonna be very busy when the end comes, and we say, if the end comes before we finish either one of these projects, 
then we say hallelujah. <laughs> Praise Jah. But we're going to be busy right up until the end. Jehovah, with his help and his support, because Jehovah does not like and he doesn't bless a lack of zeal and enthusiasm. So we want to make sure we're zealously working right up until the end comes. Yep, even though we just told you that our construction projects are going to extend themselves far into the future, don't you dare get off that hamster wheel. Keep working, you good-for-nothing slaves. Well, in conclusion, we say with your continued support and prayers and our behalf, fast-moving, amazing things are happening in the earthly part of Jehovah's organization. And we give all thanks to Jehovah, that great uh, celestial chariot rider. We give thanks to him. And we give thanks to the heavenly part of his organization. How we appreciate the direction we are receiving by means of Holy Spirit. These talks have been especially prepared at the direction of the governing body. They want the worldwide brotherhood to be aware of the content as soon as possible. Yeah, their message is so urgent that they're postponing the most important talks until next month. Talks which you can already view on my apostate channel. What a joke. Please, pay close attention and enjoy the program. Well, it's an absolute delight to be here today, isn't it? <laughs> and you're going to get happier as the morning goes along. Imagine being penetrated by this man. Now a question in reference to love for Jehovah. Is it reasonable for Jehovah to expect us to love him with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength? Is it reasonable? First off, we have a talk delivered by Gag Flegel titled, Love Jehovah, Praise Jehovah, where he tells us why we can be sure Big J loves us with his whole heart. There's no way this man is not a lizard in this guise. I mean, just look at him. He has to be a lizard under that skin suit. Yes, absolutely. Why can we say that? Because Jehovah loves us with his whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jehovah loves us with his whole heart, mind, soul, and strength? Um, the Bible never says that. The sentiment is nice, but most of the time, in the Old Testament at least, God's love is entirely conditional. Jehovah only loves you if you obey him, and if you disobey him, he's more than happy to sell you off to your enemies, like any merciful dad would. Jehovah loves us with all his heart, his compassion. Doesn't that increase your love? for him? Yeah, a skinwalker telling me God loves me definitely doesn't make me feel more loved. With Jehovah's mighty Holy Spirit, he created everything. Oh, we're bringing out the drawings now. Beginning with his firstborn son, to myriads of mighty spirit creatures, to the vast universe with its trillions upon trillions of stars, to this beautiful earth with its endless variety of plant and animal life. And endless variety of parasites and viruses and whatever this is. Wow, Jehovah, you're such a wonderful creator. Jehovah could use rocks, he could use trees, he could use birds, he could use beasts of the field, but no, he's ch chosen his faithful servants, he's chosen you and me to declare his praise. Yeah, because we're the only species silly enough to willingly submit ourselves to an invisible entity. Recently on a trip to the western United States, my wife and I were able to observe bison, elk, and moose. From a safe distance, of course. <laughs> They're humongous, very powerful animals. Well, what if Jehovah had chosen one of them to declare his praise? Every time you would approach, they would say, praise Jah. But he hasn't. They just eat ass. <laughs> I'm dead inside. And now we have a talk by Lying Lush titled Love for Jehovah in Asian Times. And it's probably a first-hand account because just look at this dude. He's 
Verily holding on to dear life. Let my man rest. Please just send Lush to the Bahamas and let him retire in peace there, please. I beg you. Later in human history, Jehovah created the nation of Israel and gave them a beautiful land full of good things. How could the Israelites show their appreciation? Jehovah again provided an opportunity for his people to give. In this case, he gave them a command to tithe. And of course, he starts his talk by talking about giving, which has become Watchtower's favorite word by now. Lush starts talking about tithing, which was the ancient Israelite practice of being taxed 10% of your income, of your produce, to the temple, to the Levite. <laughs> A practice that, interestingly enough, Mormons still practice today. So, I wonder why Lush is even mentioning tithing. So, although it was required by law, tithing was entirely between the individual Israelite and Jehovah. Thus, the arrangement allowed each Israelite to demonstrate his personal love for Jehovah. But, what if somebody secretly held back and did not give Jehovah the whole tithe, perhaps giving less than a tenth? How would Jehovah feel about that? Would he be inclined to bless those who were stingy? Ooh, a very subtle form of asking for money. Oh, you wouldn't want to hold off on your monthly recurrent payment to JW.org, would you? That's not likely. On the other hand, how would Jehovah feel about those who generously gave even more than a tenth? Well, we don't have to guess. Guess. Some years later, Jehovah inspired the prophet Malachi to remind the nation of their privilege of giving. What did Jehovah say? Let's see at Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring the entire tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and test me out, please, in this regard, uh, Jehovah of Armies says, to see whether I will not open to you the floodgates of the heavens, and pour out on you a blessing until there's nothing lacking. This Bible verse is so overused by prosperity preachers, but Watchtower used to apply it mostly to the preaching work, you know, like, oh, give your best in service to Jehovah, and he's gonna bless you abundantly. I don't remember them using this verse to talk about monetary donations. Um, I guess the governing body is just embracing their prosperity gospel now. <laughs> What's next? Are they going to be traveling in private jets as well? You know, I've owned three different jets in my life and I and used them and just burning them up for the Lord Jesus Christ. Televangelist Jesse Duplantis says God himself told him it's time for an upgrade. He said, I want you to believe me for a Falcon 7X. So I said, okay. A Falcon 7 jet like this one to preach to more people around the world. And he's asking his followers for the $54 million. I really believe that if Jesus was physically on the earth today, he wouldn't be riding a donkey. So what have we learned from our brief discussion of tithing? That Jehovah created us to find joy in giving. And we give generously of our time and resources because we love Jehovah, not because someone is observing and keeping track of what we do. Lushtin talks about the Nazarite arrangement, when Israelite men and women could volunteer to abstain from things like alcohol and cutting their hair and touching dead people. So what can we learn from the Nazarite arrangement? that Jehovah deeply appreciates and favors those who show their love for Him by going beyond what is required. Today, this is true of ones who have their circumstances or the circumstances to pioneer and those who are able to serve as volunteers at branch offices and in other theocratic assignments. The only difference is that God Himself, supposedly, established the Nazarite arrangement, but pioneering was never mentioned in the Bible. It's not the same thing, Lush. So, does Jehovah's organization today benefit from the principles behind the tithing and Nazarite arrangements? How do we as, we as individuals support modern-day arrangements for pure worship? And does a closer examination of the arrangements for pure worship in ancient Israel indicate a need for further adjustments today? Now you might be wondering, Panda, 
Why is an Austrian zombie man talking about updated Israelite protocol? Well, what does this have to do with anything? Well, now his buddy Sam the Reaper is going to introduce some of the biggest changes this religion has seen in the last hundred years. For the answers to these questions, let us give our attention to Brother Samuel Hurd, a member of the governing body, who will share the next talk in this symposium entitled Love for Jehovah in Modern Times. As you listen to Brother Loesch discuss the arrangement for tithing and Nazarite ship, did you try to make a connection with arrangements that we have for modern day worship? Maybe you were wondering, what corresponds to tithing today? As Brother Loesch mentioned, although tithing was a requirement for the Israelites, it also provided Jehovah's people with regular opportunities to demonstrate their love for Jehovah by giving Him their best. Of course, we no longer have a fixed amount of our income that we're commanded to give to Jehovah. The tithing arrangement ended with the Mosaic Law, and Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 says, We are now under the law of the Christ. True Christians today give Jehovah just as they have resolved in their hearts. But the tithing arrangement illustrates something that Jehovah still expects of his people today. Remember, the tithe was to be not just a tenth, but the best tenth of a person's produce and his animals. Jehovah deserves nothing less than our very best. With that in mind, how can we give Jehovah our very best? Of course, we try hard to obey all of Jehovah's commands, but there is one command that stands out as an identifying mark of true Christians today. What is it? Go, therefore, and make disciples of people of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. And look, I am with you all the days until the conclusion of the system of things. Wait, I thought the identifying mark of true Christians was the love they had for one another. Wasn't that your whole sales pitch this entire time? Were you surprised that we read that verse? Of course not. We see from these verses that the disciple-making work is a requirement for all Christians. No, it's not. It's a command by Jesus to the disciples that were listening to him. Fun fact, nowhere in the New Testament are all Christians required to evangelize. That's something Rutherford just made up. There's even this one Bible verse, let me see if I can pull it up for you. It, it says something like, oh, you know, some Christians are good at being prophets, some Christians are good at being teachers, others at preaching, being evangelizers, so not everyone has the same gift. But you know what all Christians are required to do? Love their neighbor, which is something a lot of Christians just fall short on. And you dear brothers and sisters have built your lives around that scripture. You have given and continue to give your very best to obey this life-saving command. And we commend you for that. Yikes, you can even kind of feel the sadness in Sam's voice like a doctor who's about to deliver some terrible news to his patients. <laughs> Guys, I know you've dedicated your life to the preaching work, but what I'm about to tell you is just going to invalidate a lifetime of hard work. <laughs> but before that, let me play you a short overview of the history of reporting ministry hours. When did we begin reporting field service activity? Prior to 1920, only coal porters, as pioneers were then called, were asked to submit reports. But beginning in 1920, everyone in the congregation who participated in the witness work was asked to turn in a weekly report. In January 1939, a suggestion was placed before congregation publishers, a goal of 60 hours per month. Early on, congregation field service reports were thorough. 
Over the years, the forms used to report publishers' field service activity have been simplified. Reports have consistently included back calls, or return visits, Bible studies, publication placements, and hours spent in the disciple-making work. As was the case back then, there's always a story behind a field service report. The first time I walked into a kingdom hall, when I was 16, I saw this chart on the stage. And I realized this organization is concerned about what we do, what we say, and how much we say about Jehovah. And what you wear, and who you have sex with, what movies you watch, what thoughts you have. Yeah, this organization is concerned with everything except the protection of children. I realized that from the start, so that after the third month of studying, when I started going out in field service, I wanted to turn my time in too. And they showed me how to do it, and I've been turning it in ever since. Oh boy, do I have news for you, dear. Alan and I were invited into the Special Pioneer Service in 1966. The monthly requirement was 150 hours and 50 return visits. It was a good incentive. 150 hours? That's just 10 hours short of a full-time job. No wonder these people never saved up money for retirement. Well, we had a quota back then of 150 magazines, one for every hour, as special pioneers or missionaries. And one day we run into our fellow missionary and his wife on the way to the movies. They went every Saturday, every Saturday. But this particular Saturday, he says, oh, I can't go to the movies because I don't have my 150 magazines, so I've got five more to go, and then we can go to the movies. It's insane how she doesn't see the sheer pharisaical nature of these rules. I also love how they propped her up against these Joseph Rutherford books, which are not even available to common Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, if JWs could only read the batshit crazy propaganda that's stored in these books, the, a lot of them would leave. This started in 1961, when we were sent as special pioneers. Started pioneering in a trailer of five hours of service every day. Every day. And uh, getting our time was no problem. Living for a month on $100, that was a problem. <laughs> so Dave said, I'm, I'm going to go yeah. out and get a job. About that time, they had put a new store in town. Beautiful. He went down to that store and told him, I'm going to work one day a week. What are you going to do the rest of the time? <laughs> so he said, well, I knock on doors and tell them about God's kingdom. I said, really? This is my door. Knock on it. He came in the truth. His wife came in the truth. Children are in the truth. This could be anyone's grandparents. Just look at them. The generation that was not supposed to pass away, being used for propaganda by the same corporation that lied to them their whole lives. This lovely couple lived in poverty because they had to be knocking on doors 150 hours a month. Best life ever, right? <laughs> I never felt it was a question of getting the hours in. I always try to make them quality calls, you know, try to say something with the people, not just go there and get the, the magazines placed. Or my Bible studies, I would try so hard to really get to know the people but it was never just a question of getting in hours. We're trying to save lives. Nah, it was definitely the hours. Come on, lady, you're not going to trick anyone here. And Brother Butel is now 100 years of age, and Sister Butel is 98. What a good start on living forever. <laughs> As we've seen, the arrangement for reporting our field activity has served a valuable purpose for many years. Of course it did. It was a strategic move by Rutherford to get more people to distribute his wacky literature. Requiring ministry hours served a way to keep JWs in line, as a way to measure the spirituality of the flock. If you didn't make your hours, you would be shamed by the elders and pressured to do more. I have to admit, it's sort of genius in a way. However, as Brother Fligo mentioned in the opening talk of this symposium, Jehovah's people are motivated to praise Jehovah because of our great love for him. Sharing in the ministry also reflects our sincere love for our neighbors and our love 
for the good news. So we engage in our ministry not because we fill out a report each month. We might say that our ministry is our personal gift to Jehovah and to our neighbors. But Jehovah is realistic. He knows that many of our brothers and sisters are limited by circumstances, such as advancing age or serious health issues. Others cope with the rising cost of living, civil strife, war, or opposition to our work. The recent COVID-19 pandemic greatly limited what many of us were able to do in the ministry. Some who have preached faithfully for decades may be embarrassed to report little time in the ministry. If that is true of you, should you feel that you have failed in some way? Not at all. Oh, please. So the reason you dropped the hour requirement is because you feel compassion for your brothers and sisters? Let me remind you that JWs were required to count their ministry hours throughout every war since the 1920s and in countries where the work was banned. Jehovah didn't drop the hour requirement throughout the last 100 years, so why would he drop them now? Sure, times are tough, but they've always been, and I would argue pioneers back in the 1940s and pioneers serving under the Soviet Union had it way harder than us. So why the changes? Can you imagine Jehovah judging an Israelite unfaithful because his tenth was less than another person's tenth? Of course not. Everyone's circumstances and abilities are different. Brother Loesch explained that although tithing was a requirement in ancient Israel, Jehovah did not require others to monitor or keep track of each person's tithe. Tithing was entirely between the individual Israelite and Jehovah. The governing body believes this same principle can be applied when it comes to reporting our time spent in the ministry. Our ministry involves much more than counting time. For this reason, we are pleased to announce that beginning November the 1st, 2023, Congregation publishers will no longer be asked to report the amount of time they spend in the ministry. Nor will publishers be asked to report their placements, the videos they show, or their return visits. Instead, the field service report will simply have a box that will allow each publisher to indicate that he or she shared in any form of the ministry. They're in demand. There will be one more box where publishers report the number of different Bible studies they conduct. We are witnessing a monumental event, a hundred year old tradition, which has been a hallmark of the Jehovah's Witness religion, flushed down the drain and gone when the end is more imminent than ever. It would have been more fitting for Samuel Hurd to just gotten off the podium, walked around the entire auditorium, and slapped the face of every old timer that has counted their hours for decades. Oops, turns out the hour requirement had no biblical backing after all this time, and it turns out that Watchtower can just twist any scripture to justify their policies, then turn around a few years later and use other scriptures to annul the same policy. Now you might be wondering, Panda, what was the scriptural justification that Watchtower used in the first place for counting hours? Well, according to the organized book, you know that little cult manual we used in, in the Kingdom Hall, there was a rhetorical question put forth. Since Jehovah knows what I am doing in his service, why do I need to put in a report to the congregation? Excellent question. And what was Watchtower's response? Well, Jehovah required some of his servants in the Bible to count stuff. That's literally the whole reason. The Bible has numbers, therefore you must count your ministry hours. And of course there's another pragmatic reason which is the actual reason ministry hours were counted is because the organization is a control freak and they wanted to know 
you know, which areas of the world needed more help with evangelizing. So that's why they counted more hours. But this was a teaching that JWs just had to accept. It never had any biblical backing whatsoever. And since it had no biblical backing in the first place, it's super easy for Samuel Hurd to just dismiss the policy by taking another out of context Bible verse out of his greasy ass. This simplified report serves a valuable purpose. It will allow us to know the number of active publishers in each land. It will also help us to know whether certain territories are producing Bible studies and where there is a greater need for pioneers, special pioneers, missionaries, and kingdom halls. Your previous reports could already do that and with much more detail, you lunatic. The governing body is confident that you dear ones will continue to render whole soul service to Jehovah by doing all that you can in his service. And just as Jehovah richly blessed faithful Israelites who generously supported the tithing arrangement, he will richly bless your sacrifice of praise. But wait, what about the Nazarite arrangement? Is there a similar provision in the modern day organization? Certainly. We all do well to imitate the Nazarite's example of self-sacrifice and courage. However, as Brother Loesch explained, the Nazarites had to meet certain requirements that were not expected of Israelites in general. The same is true of modern-day pioneers. They have volunteered to devote a certain number of hours to spend in the ministry. Thus, auxiliary and regular pioneers special pioneers, missionaries, and circuit overseers, and their wives will continue to report the number of hours they spend in the ministry, along with the number of different Bible studies they conduct. What? You literally just explained why there's no biblical requirement for counting ministry hours, but pioneers are still required to turn in their hours because of the Nazarite vow? Let me remind you, Sammy the Whammy, that the Nazarite vow was a direct provision by Jehovah. Where in the Bible is God requiring pioneers to preach 50 hours a month? This requirement is completely arbitrary. The double speak here is just insane. Sure, counting hours is not biblical if you're a publisher, but it's totally biblical if you're pioneering? What the hell is going on here? You might as well just get off your podium, walk up to the front of the audience and take a massive dump in front of them because you really think every one of your followers is this stupid. Yes, Jehovah promises that his people, and young ones in particular, would reach out to do more in this time of the end. Many pioneers eventually attend the School for Kingdom Evangelizers. They become special pioneers, field missionaries, and even circuit overseers with their wives. We thank Jehovah for those who reach out to serve as pioneers. Yeah, good luck getting more people to slave away for free, you cancerous potato. No one wants to pioneer anymore. What will these adjustments in reporting our ministry mean for you elders and circuit overseers? It will be even more important that you brothers be discerning shepherds. You will have to know the flock well. For example, evaluating a congregation's spiritual health or a brother's qualifications to serve as an elder or ministerial servant will not simply be a matter of computing averages, time spent in the ministry, literature placements, and so forth. No, you will have to know the brothers. What is their attitude toward the ministry? Are they zealous to, for pure worship? What is their reputation in regard to the ministry? Do they take advantage of opportunities to give a witness? Do they help others to do so, including the members of their family? 
In other words, elders will now have to actually judge the character of their flock instead of judging them by how many hours they spend knocking on doors. But I'm sure they will find some new creative way to judge people, maybe by how much money they donate. I don't know. Elders always have a way to surprise us. As we have discussed, Jehovah clearly deserves our... What a disaster. We all know the real reason publishers are no longer required to report their time. Watchtower wants to hide the numbers. It's as easy as that. They know they have mediocre growth. And the only way to hide the decline is by not asking for hours altogether. So I'm sure the 2023 annual report is going to be the last one we're going to be seeing ever. And it's going to be released out in January, I believe. But I think Watchtower just shot itself in the foot with this one. Because as I've mentioned before, if you give people the opportunity to be lazy, most of them will take it. That 10 hour monthly requirement for regular publishers was a way to keep them motivated. Because if you didn't preach for 10 hours a month, you would be considered unexemplary and would not be allowed to move up the congregational ladder. But all you have to do now is check a box leave a tract and some crusty laundromat and you're good to go for the month. What a joke. This is not going to motivate JWs to preach more. It's gonna do the complete opposite. So thank you, Sam the Reaper, because you and your buddies are doing more damage to this religion than the entire apostate community ever could. Please don't stop. Well, brothers and sisters, hasn't this been an amazing program? <laughs> if by amazing you mean a monumentally stupid program where you dismantled some of your core doctrines and eliminated one of your most effective methods of control, showing the entire world that your religion is not only a fraud but that you're also incompetent cult leaders, then yes Mark, amazing stuff. This is truly a historic day in the history of Jehovah's Witnesses. For all the wrong reasons. And maybe our hearts right now are more full of love and appreciation for our wonderful God, Jehovah, than ever before. We've deepened our understanding of Jehovah's mercy, his compassion, and his patience. And what about that announcement about our field service reporting? Jehovah is dignifying us. He has confidence in us. So, if Jehovah is dignifying publishers by not requiring them to record their hours, does that mean he's not dignifying pioneers since they're still required to track their time? Do you see what happens when you hold on to such blatant double standards, Mark? You see, why do we go from house to house? Why do we do cart work? Why do we make telephone calls and write letters and make return visits and start Bible studies. Why do we do all of these things? It's because we truly love our amazing and wonderful God, Jehovah. And because you have conditioned your followers to believe that if they don't share in the ministry, their wonderful Father, Jehovah, is going to destroy them at Armageddon. So, I mean, sure, JWs will tell you that they preach out of love for Jehovah and their neighbors, but they also want to save their own skin in the process. So can we really call it an act of love or more an act of self-preservation? Well, unselfish love is so powerful. It touches the hearts of those who are rightly disposed for everlasting life. And Jesus said that his true disciples would be identified, they'd be recognized by the love that they had in their midst. Well, isn't it true that so often brothers and sisters say that what it was that drew them to the truth was the love they felt from their Bible teacher or from the congregation when they began to attend meetings. Yep, that's what we call love bombing. It's when a newcomer starts receiving the attention of the whole congregation. They're love bombed. And when such individual feels lonely or has experienced a recent tragedy, that sense of immediate community into a high control group can hook them into the group. It's cult manipulation 101. My own father had the same experience because he tells me that when he visited the Kingdom Hall as a young adult, 
uh, he doesn't remember the ex what they were studying about in the watchtower, but he clearly remembers the treatment uh, and the kindness he was received with at the kingdom hall. It made a lasting impression on him. So, no, Dad, you were just love bombed. <laughs> Well, maybe we've memorized presentations, and sometimes we felt like we're giving a talk when we're at the door. But what if the person has a very specific interest? What if they have some special need, or they're facing some terrible challenge just at the time when we're calling? Ooh, what if we convert people when they're going through rough times and are emotionally vulnerable? <laughs> well, we want to look to the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. He set the perfect example for us. He showed love for people by choosing subjects that were appropriate for each individual. And his personal interest in individuals attracted people to the message. Or come to think about it, maybe it was the fact that this dude could literally heal the sick and raise the dead. Who wouldn't want to be close to someone like that, Mark? Now, Mark Sanderson briefly goes over a few separate stories from the Gospels that show Jesus being a skilled teacher. You know, the time he talks to Nicodemus and the time he asks a Samaritan woman to give him a drink. What these ancient narratives have to do with modern Jehovah's Witnesses beats me. It seems to me like you're an expert, Mark. So now, what do we learn from these two simple accounts? Well, Jesus did not use a memorized presentation. He just talked with people, and he shared with them the truths that he knew would touch their hearts. He was very quick to choose topics and words based on the interests and the concerns of the person that he was speaking to. Well, now, with all of this in mind, you may be wondering, well, you're supposed to be wondering, but... Thank you, handsome, for telling me exactly how I should feel. How can I display that same love for the people that I meet? See, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a little bit more help to see how we can show love for people and make disciples? See, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a publication that would help us to be more flexible and more responsive to the different needs and interests of the people that we meet? You already have it, you donut. It's called the Bible. Shouldn't this book, the inerrant, infallible word of God, be enough for you? I guess the early apostles were really bad at the ministry because they didn't have watchtower booklets. And what if that publication highlighted specific ways that Jesus and other first century evangelizers showed their love as they made disciples? Well you will be happy to know that Jehovah's Organization has produced just such a publication. It's a 32-page brochure entitled, Love People, Make Disciples. Oh boy, take a look at this atrocity. There's something just so eerie about this cover. Uh, look at this diverse group of people, although none of them have beards. The closest we have to a beard is this evil goatee, but this man must be worldly. <laughs> but now, would you like to see a little preview of what this brochure contains? Please watch the following video. Please kill me. This new publication, Love People, Make Disciples, is being made available in both print and digital formats in over 400 languages. How is the brochure designed to help us show love for people we meet? Unlike the tools we've used in the past, this new brochure does not give us expressions to memorize, nor does it put the emphasis on leaving literature. Rather, it features 12 lessons that focus on qualities we need to cultivate to make disciples. Is naturalness even a word? How can you force yourself to sound natural? Let's see what the cold manual has to say. If we allow a conversation to develop naturally, it is more likely that the other person will feel at ease and be open to discussing our message. Okay, so tell me this. How can a conversation flow naturally if you have an ulterior motive to preach. 
Isn't that just manipulation? I also love how each of these lessons has a short video to go along with it, because apparently if it wasn't for the videos, we would have no way to grasp this complex message. Just take a look at this short one, it's just hilarious. Like a sheep, he was brought to the slaughter. And like a lamb that is silent before its shear, so he does not open his mouth. Excuse me, do you actually know what you're reading? Really? How could I ever do so unless someone guided me? So he urged Philip to get on and sit down with him. I beg you, about whom does the prophet say this? About himself or about some other man? That's an easy passage. Philip began to speak. And starting with this scripture, he declared to him the good news about Jesus. So silly. Why couldn't they just film the Ethiopian eunuch being evangelized while his chariot was parked? <laughs> it would have saved us the awkwardness of Philip running up beside it. They went out of their way to make this conversation as unnatural as possible. How are JWs even supposed to follow his example? Should they just start running alongside vehicles when they spot someone reading a Bible or having a crucifix in their car? You just can't make this up. And the other lessons are not much better either. You have lessons on humility, empathy, and kindness. And as if these weren't qualities that take a lifetime to develop. Nope, it seems all we had to do all this time was read a little manual and that will make you a better person, as it seems. The lessons will help us see how we can imitate the qualities they demonstrated as we make disciples. Each lesson contains a video that brings the account to life. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink. Now take a look at this other gem from lesson four on humility. Our message is more appealing when we present it humbly and respectfully. Watchtower, it doesn't matter how you sugarcoat your message. Your message is supremacist in nature because you're claiming you're the only ones with the correct religion and that anyone who refuses to join your movement will eventually be destroyed. Claiming to have all the answers is the complete opposite of humility. And this book has a lot more examples of these ironic gems that just show you the manipulative nature of this religion. But sadly, I can't go through every one of them because it would take a few hours. And I know you want to get back to seeing Sanderson's beautiful face by now. By cultivating an interest in people, we can talk about things that are on their minds. What truths might we share with people once a conversation is started? Appendix A highlights basic Bible truths that we love to teach. Make it your goal to learn these basic truths and the scriptures that support them. If you do, you will be more effective in starting conversations and in making disciples. These truths are so elementary, it just validates my theory that this book is designed for babies. God has a name, God communicates with us, God is fair and unbiased, God wants to help us, that's it. Nothing more to say about the most awe-inspiring being in the universe. This religion is going backwards. For example, a conversation can be started by asking a simple question such as, Have you heard that God will soon end all suffering? Or, Did you know that the Earth's environment will be restored? Sharing a simple truth at the right time is powerful. Jesus said his sheep would listen to his voice. In other words, rightly disposed ones will recognize the truth when they hear it expressed simply. Appendix B helps us to determine whether to continue a conversation. Appendix C provides practical suggestions on how to conduct Bible studies and enjoy life forever. Yep, this manipulation manual will teach you how to manipulate people using this other, longer manual. Just as Jesus would have wanted. What if you don't feel comfortable starting conversations? Better said, 
What if you don't feel comfortable starting conversations with the ulterior motive of converting people? There, I fixed it for you. Don't worry. Beginning in January 2024, the Apply Yourself portion of each midweek meeting will help us to practice the points we are learning in this new brochure. The meeting will no longer focus on presenting a predetermined topic in Scripture. Rather, students will select topics for their assignments that they know are on the minds of those in their community. By means of realistic demonstrations, audience discussions, and talks, our meetings will assist us to develop skills that will help us start conversations naturally and adapt to each person's concerns and needs. So now JWs can choose the topic of their sample talk? Hmm, I wonder if they're gonna choose topics which are actually brought up in the ministry nowadays, such as concerns over chunning or child abuse, or are they just going to remain in their little bubble and keep talking about paradise and the condition of the dead in God's name and all that? <laughs> no matter where we live, or under what circumstances we are preaching, simply showing love will help us to find joy in our ministry. More than any specific technique, actively expressing our love for others will help us make disciples. Let me tell you a better way to show love to your neighbor, my dude. Go volunteer for a charity, give to the poor, or at the very, very least, give people the kindness of not trying to change their religion. Because trying to convert someone is the biggest show of intolerance you can have. And how is this brochure any different than the hoopla that has come before it? Watchtower has published countless ministry manuals trying to improve the disciple-making work, but the numbers just keep falling. Hey, Mark Sanderson, come here, let me tell you something. Come on, come on, Marky boy, come on. Maybe more people would be interested in joining your religion if you actually fixed the grave issues that are plaguing it. Just food for thought. We indeed thank Jehovah for this wonderful new tool to make us more effective in our ministry. It's really amazing to witness, as Jehovah's people, the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 17. It says, instead of the copper, I will bring in gold. Well. What's the point of the prophecy? You see, it outlines that good materials would gradually be replaced by even better ones. And that's exactly what we have seen. And this is supposed to be the gold that is replacing the copper? Your publications become more and more simplified as the years go by. We are reverting. The previous indoctrination manuals used to be much more robust, even if they were also complete nonsense. <laughs> because remember that reasoning book, the little brown book we were supposed to carry with us in the ministry all the time? I remember I carried it, and it was useful. What happened to that? W was that just too complicated for the sheep? I mean, at this rate, in a couple of years, I wouldn't be surprised if an older Mark Sanderson released a coloring book designed to help you become a better teacher. What a joke. Every, with each of these organizational adjustments, we went from something good to something better. And I think with the things that were announced today, isn't it true that we're seeing that again? We're going from something that was good to something even better. And I think we'd agree too that Jehovah is helping us to mature as a people. He has confidence in us that our concern is not merely the number of hours or the publications that we place that we're going to put on a report. We love Jehovah, we love people, and we want to make disciples. And so, what does all of this mean? It means you have no fucking clue what you're doing. And what does it not mean? Well, first, these adjustments do not, they do not mean that we are in any way slacking off in our ministry. It does not mean that we are slowing down as we approach the Great Tribulation. Nothing could be further from the truth. I agree with you, my poor sign friend. It does not mean Watchtower is slacking off. It means the rank and file have already slacked off. 
for three years now, and your cult has no option but to stop counting hours in order to hide the decline. I have simply not found another good reason why you would destroy a hundred year old tradition and stop counting the numbers. Right now, we have more than 50,000 applications from students who want to attend the School for Kingdom Evangelizers. We're appointing new missionaries, new special pioneers and temporary special pioneers, and an army of new regular pioneers. And in some lands, like the Philippines, sorry, I have to mention the Philippines, um, <laughs> we're experiencing record growth. Can you imagine a 9% increase this year with a new peak of 253,876 publishers and 12,954 baptized just in this last year. Isn't that amazing? This man is not only a professional donut picker, he's great at cherry picking as well. The Philippines? Are you kidding me? We're talking about the island nation that is mostly Catholic, deeply impoverished, and has a long history with religious cults. And please, I mean no disrespect by saying this because if you are a Pinoy from the Philippines watching this, I love you. I think your country looks amazing and gorgeous. But let's be real for a second. The Philippines is just the perfect nation for cults like Jehovah's Witnesses to proliferate, just like Mexico and Angola. If you want to impress us, Mark, say there's been an increase in Europe, in Japan, in the United States, countries where you are in serious trouble right now. The Philippines, get the hell out of here, man. You probably spend more time at Jollibee's than in the ministry when you're in the country. Please know, please know that in no way is the work slowing down. Our ministry has never been more important than it is now. If you actually believe that your ministry is more important than ever, you would not have gotten rid of your hour requirement. Now at this point, you're just lying through your teeth. So what then do these adjustments mean? Well, they do mean that our motivation for carrying out the ministry has been even more clarified. You see, we share in the ministry because we love Jehovah and because we love people. Was that not the motivation before? So this is the time when we want to be busy in Jehovah's work. Do you remember Jesus' parable of the master and the three slaves? It's just so fitting that Mark ends his talk by reminding his sheep to keep running on the hamster wheel and comparing them to slaves. And guess what he's about to mention? Yep, the Great Tribulation. What an exciting time this is. The governing body sincerely hopes that many more will come to join us in serving Jehovah before the end comes. And remember, Jehovah delights in rewarding his people for their faithfulness and for their generosity. So with the great tribulation fast approaching, have no doubt that Jehovah will soon richly reward you as we all give generously of our time and our effort to love our amazing God, Jehovah, and to make- I just can't do it. I can't take this shit no more, man. Get off the stage, you lunatic. What a way to end the disastrous meeting. The worst one yet, hands down. I mean, let's just recap on everything we went through on this annual meeting. Prophet Jeff tells us that the governing body will never apologize and that, hey, surprise, surprise, the governing body takes decisions without an ounce of Holy Spirit involved. Then Daddy Splain, one of the most dogmatic persons on the planet, tells us not to be dogmatic and then he admitted that Watchtower was wrong in the past. And then we got these four bozos just dismantling some of the core doctrines of the religion in front of our eyes for the whole world to see. So thank you, governing body. Thank you for being such incompetent cult leaders and for showing all your followers who you truly are. From the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses, this is JW Broadcasting.
So guys, let me know what you thought of this talk in the comments below and let me know the moment you lost the cringe challenge. Making these videos takes a lot of my time and energy. So if you would like to support my activism, please join me on Patreon. It's only $1 a month and you get early access to all my videos. This work would not be possible without the monetary support of my Patreons and my YouTube channel members. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. And special thanks to my Tony Morris rank members on Patreon, Michael D, Bonnie D, Jay Miller, Christian P, Jason C, Juan R, Robert C, Stargazer K, and J.I.O. You guys are the best. Take it easy guys, have a wonderful day, and stay away from the tower.